you, Alan. My apologies for those who came thinking they were going to hear Albert, but Albert could not be here today, so you've got me. I'm sorry. Um, we're reading today in uh, Exodus chapter 32. I'll actually be looking at chapter 32 and 33. Um, two fairly big long chapters, but I'll only be picking out portions thereof. I've been reading a book lately um, called The Splendour of Holiness. It's a book I got back in the 1960s, maybe early 1970s. I thought I'd read it, but I'm going through it again. I think, I don't remember reading all this. And it's been really refreshing to read it again. And one thing that has come out, sin and holiness are incompatible. They just do not meld. They, are no, they just do not come together. And so that's where I sort of started thinking as I was preparing for today. So let's read Exodus chapter 32. And we'll start reading at verse 1. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol, cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Aaron, the brother of Moses. That's really his only claim to fame at this time. He was not a priest. The priesthood had not been established. But uh, he was Moses' brother. Moses has gone up onto the mountain, Mount Sinai, to receive God's laws, the instructions for building the tabernacle and all the rest of it. Moses is up with God, and he's up there for 40 days. And the people became restless. The people at the camp were saying, Where is he? What's he doing up there? We want a God to show, to, look, to, to worship. And Aaron listened to them. Those are very bad words. Aaron listened to them. He made an image in the shape of a calf. And then he turned around and said to the people, this is your God who brought you out of Egypt. How wrong could he be? You know, it's been said that when Aaron listened to the people, it's like our politicians today. In a democratic government as we have, the po politicians take a poll. Says, what do the people want? Where do they want to go? And they find out where they, what the people want, where they want to go, and then they say, let's take them there. And then they go out the front and say, we are leaders. And it's the people pushing. It's not a very good way to govern. God's way is a better way. But we need godly leaders. And Aaron was not one of those leaders. He was easily led by the people, or pushed by the people, and he led them astray. Now while Aaron was making this idol, Moses is on the mountain. He's talking with God, and we'll continue reading in Exodus 32, verse 7. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down, because your people whom you brought out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. They made an idol and they worshipped it, and God disowned them. God said to Moses, your people, the people you led out of Egypt, he says, these are not my people, these are your people, and God disowned them. And God was going to destroy them, we read in verse 10, and instead make Moses a great nation. 
Let's read, continue reading Exodus 32, verses 11. But Moses sought the favour of the Lord, his God. Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger. Relent and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, whom you swore by your own self. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and I will give your descendants all this land I promised them and it will be their inheritance forever. While Aaron was caving into the requests of the people, the Israelites, Moses was on the mountain pleading with God. The Lord had told Moses what had happened. Moses knew exactly what had happened. They had built, built a calf and they were they were worshipping it and God expressed his anger and he threatened to destroy Israel. And God wanted to establish his covenant with Moses but Moses made a bold response to God. When God said these are your people, the people you led out of Egypt, Moses reminded him, said, hold on, these are your chosen people, these are your, your people. Then he says, relent, do not bring disaster on your people. Moses' appeal was in two parts. First he said that by destroying Israel, the Egyptians would get the wrong idea, the wrong message. They'd say, why did their God take them out of the Egypt to, just to destroy them? And secondly, God must remain faithful to the promises he made to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. So Moses appealed on those two points and God heard Moses' plea and he did not carry out his judgments. And verse 14 of chapter 32 says, Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. Praise the Lord for a godly leader like Moses how we need more godly men like him. Let's read verse 19. When Moses approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, his anger burned and he threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them to pieces at the foot of the mountain. And he took the calf the people had made and burned it in the fire. Then he ground it to powder, scattered it on the water and made the Israelites drink it. And he said to the Aaron, what did these people do to you that you led them into such great sin? Aaron thought he was leading the people. The people said, we want something we can see. And he thought he was leading the people. Let's make a calf. What does uh, Moses say? He said, the only place Aaron led them was into such great sin. How we need to be careful how we live our lives, that we're not leading others into great sin. We need to... Stand firm for God. If Moses was in a minority. He was making a stand. He's up on the mountain pleading with God. Aaron was caving in to their requests. We need men of God like Moses. Verse 26. So Moses stood at the entrance to the camp and said, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the Levites rallied to him. Then he said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Each man strap a sword to his side, go back and forth through the camp from one end to the other, each killing his brother, his friend and neighbour. The Levites did as Moses commanded and that day about 3,000 of the people died. When Moses saw Israel's idolatry and their worship of this uh, idol for himself, his reaction was much the same as God's. He was angry. He was upset so upset that he smashed those tablets of stone which he had the law inscribed on, the Ten Commandments. Then Moses called out, Who is for the Lord? Who is going to stand with me for the Lord? And Moses found out that he wasn't alone. And it's the same today. Sometimes we're in the situation where we think, I'm alone. I'm alone. Nobody is there. There are no other Christians around. 
nobody to help me. I pray for our three young men who are in the, uh, on the um, armed forces that they will have the integrity to be able to stand firm, that they will have those who will stand beside them and that they will be supported. I myself had a struggle when I first started work. I was only 15 years of age and uh, I worked the first week and uh, come the end of the week, we were getting ready to go home and the third year electrical apprentice came up and says, Barry, what are you doing this weekend? Well, um, I'm going to do such and such tomorrow. And I left it there. He didn't. He then turned to me and said, what are you doing on Sunday? I felt trapped. I was having just to blend in with the crowd, just to go along. I think God was forcing, you make a stand, Barry. You make a stand. And I said, I'm going to church. It was like a little field mouse hiding, trying to hide. And at that, the knockoff whistle blew and we all sort of took off. And I thought that was it. But the next week, it came back. That third year electric apprentice kept on coming around and taunting me. He's having a go at me about going to church and all the rest of it. And it was then that um, I was given the great encouragement. The second year apprentice, just above me as a fitter, he turned over and said to this uh, guy, I said, get off him. I'm a Christian too. We're not alone. When God wants us to stand, we're not alone. And it went a bit further than that because a couple of days later, one of the laborers, one of the TAs came up to me and introduced himself. And he says, I used to be the worst man at work here. I used to bash my wife. The family is in tatters. I was about to lose my job. I was a drunkard. And he said, I was invited to a series of meetings at the Seventh Day Adventist. He said, I accepted the Lord. And he stood beside me. It was great to have somebody standing beside you. We need those people to stand beside us. We need them to, uh, to support us. Anyway, Moses took that public stand and his courage moved the Levites. They had not participated in that worshiping of that idol, in the building of it. And they stood by Moses. And Moses says, who will join with me? Who will stand for God? And the Levites went to him. Now the Levites were his own family. He was, Moses was a Levite. So Moses told the Levites, put on your sword and go through the camp. Kill everyone who has worshipped, been involved in the worship of this idol. And they went through the camp and killed 3,000 men. Brothers and uh, Friends, neighbours, they killed them. God passed his judgment on them. Now this incident highlights a biblical principle here that as believers, we are responsible to maintain holiness in our community. We are responsible for the testimony around us. We are responsible to uphold God's laws and to obey him. God must come first. No relationship can have priority over our commitment to the Lord. But not everyone who was involved in the worship of this idol was caught up in that slaughter. There were others who had worshipped the idol and they were not caught up. God knew who they were. And we read there in ver the last, or, yeah, verse 35 of chapter 20, 32, and the Lord struck the people with a plague because of what they did with the calf Aaron had made. A plague. Maybe a bit like COVID. Maybe, maybe worse than COVID. God sent a, a plague and many people died. We're not told how many people have died, but he struck them down with a plague. And God exacted his judgment on them. 
God forgives, but he also punishes. And for the first time, Israel were in the situation now where they had to learn that as a serious lesson. Go back to Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve had sinned, and God cast them out of the garden. <coughs> his punishment on them. And God says in uh, Exodus 32, verse 34, when the time comes for me to punish, I will punish. So God disciplined his people. God's first discipline was to punish the men. 3,000 men died. Then he brought on them the uh, plague. God knew who these others were. But there was more to come. Because we read in that first verse that the Israelites went to Aaron. But to me, it's almost like they almost said all, but there were a lot more people went to Aaron and said, give us an idol, give us a God. And God had to pass his punishment on them as well. And sometimes God does his punishment straight away. We sin and we're punished straight away. Other times we sin and it might be a while before we're caught out, before somebody identifies us. And yet there are other times when we think, I did that and I got away with it. And so God brings out his uh, uh, third course of judgment on the uh, Israelites. He turned around and said to Moses, he says, Take these people to the promised land. You take them and I will send an angel with you to lead you. But I myself will not go with you. There was to be a separation. As I said at the start, sin and holiness are incompatible. They had sinned, God is holy, and they were incompatible. God says, I'm withdrawing. And so... He withdrew. And that was uh, upsetting to Moses. Moses said, but Lord, you can't do that. Why not? And uh, we'll read uh, chapter 33, verses 1 to 5. Then the Lord said to Moses, leave this place, you and the people you brought out of Egypt, and go up to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Pittites, the Perizzites, the Clivites and the Jebusites. I will drive them out. He says, go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. When the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn, and no one put on any ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Tell the Israelites, you are a stiff-necked people. If I were to go with you, even for a moment, I might destroy you. Now take off your ornaments, and I will decide what to do with you. So the Israelites stripped off their ornaments at Mount Horeb. God had prescribed his third form of judgment. He said, I will not go with you as they made their way to the promised land. You know, I was reading a little summary of uh, this and it says, man is never as bad as he can be, but mankind separated from God is as bad off as he can be. He, man is al always going from bad to worse. But being separated from God, we can't be any worse off. Moses was faced with a dilemma. He had to lead the children of Israel, but God was not going to go with them. When we're faced with a serious problem, what do we do? How do we approach it? How do we approach that problem? I like this example. Somebody says, let the sun represent God and you have a 10 cent coin and you compare the 10 cent coin and the sun what's the difference only a couple of millimeters 
and a few million miles. The problem is we hold that prop, the, the problem, the one, 10 cent coin, we hold it so close to our eyes that we can't see God. We block him out. Are we so focused on our problem that we don't look to God? We need to look to God, get his help. He's the one who can sort it out. He's the one who can help us. God's power is greater than any problem we'll ever face. We can look so close at our problems that we allow them to block our vision of God. Moses was concentrating on focusing on God. He is the God is the one who solves these problems. God would keep his promise he had made to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. But instead of going before Israel in person, he would appoint an angel. He says, you are a stiff-necked people. You have been disobedient. He says, if you had been people like you were in Egypt, suffering and afflicted and I heard your affliction and I came down to you I would have helped but he says you are a stubborn people and stubborn people need to be disciplined and it's better that God depart from them than that he come suddenly upon them and destroy them when Moses gave Israel this message they responded by taking off their ornaments and mourning apparently stripping off of the ornaments was a sign of mourning and re uh, repentance in the ancient world. And at last, Israel was impressed with the seriousness of sin. Whether this was a true repentance or not, only the Lord knew. Previously, they'd taken their ornaments off and given them to Aaron and said, make us an idol. And now God says, take them off. To put them down. Let's be serious about this perhaps they were starting to learn their lesson the hard way Exodus 33 verse 7 now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away calling it the tent of meeting anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp and whenever Moses went out to the tent all the people rose and stood at the entrance to their tent and watched Moses until the he entered the tent and as Moses went into the tent the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses this is where I started my message reading these verses and reading this chapter to me it is a unique chapter it is a conversation between Moses a man and God and it's good to be able to study that this was a special tent. It was not the tabernacle. The tabernacle hadn't been uh, built. It was probably on the design board, but it hadn't been built. It hadn't been dedicated. But God met with Moses in this tent. And he spoke with Moses face to face as a man speaks with a friend. And everyone knew that God was there because that pillar of cloud came down and rested at the front of the entrance to the tent. While that cloud was there, they knew that God was there talking with Moses. Sin is always costly. Israel's sin not only led to the death of thousands of people, but it robbed the nation of the presence of the Lord, both in the camp and on their pilgrim journey. And as Charles Spurgeon said, God never permits his people to sin successfully. This chapter is very significant in that it records this dialogue between Moses and God. And Moses is talking to God face to face. How unique is that? Especially when we link this with the verse that says, No man can see God and live. But Moses talked with God who came down in that pillar of cloud. Verse 12 is interesting that Moses starts the conversation. In a way, he confronts God. I find this uh, very um, aggressive on Moses' part, I suppose is a word I could say. He confronts God. He says, 
you have been telling me to leave these people. And he says, you have not let me know who you will send with me. As the conversation goes on, it becomes evident that Moses is asking, will you be leading us? Will you be coming with us on this journey? Then Moses said, you keep telling me that you are pleased with me. And you said, I know you by name and that you have found favour with me. If this is true, teach me your way so I may know you and continue to find favour with you. Moses earnestly desired to learn God's ways and to know him better. Is that our desire when we come to meet with him? When we have our quiet time at home in the morning, do we come asking to know him better? Do we come, teach me your ways, Lord? Is that our prayer? That's what he wants us to do. Do we talk to God as a friend? After all, he is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Do we have a desire to know God more and more? As we get to know God better, we all know that God already knows us and we will please God and find favour in his sight. Look at God's response. My presence will go with you. We have a similar promise in the New Testament today. And God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Oh, that we would dwell in his presence day by day. Moses then asked for reassurance that God himself will go with Moses and the children of Israel. God needed to hear God's promise. He needed to hear it for himself. Moses needed to reaffirm his dependence on the Lord. Without the Lord, the mission would be a failure. And Moses was the first to acknowledge that fact. Any work we do without God is just that, doing work. In verse 16, Moses asked, How will anyone know that you are pleased with me? And, that your peop and with your people unless you go with us. He said, God, your presence is what distinguishes us from all the other nations. We need you. We have to have you. And with that plead, God reassured Moses in verse 17, I will go with you. I am pleased with you. And I know you by name. That last reassurance, I know you by name, was very pleasing to Moses. It was reassuring to him and to be reassuring to hear, I will go with you. It was so important to Moses to know God's will and to be known by God by name. We need to be known by God. Does he know us? When we come to him as and accept the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour. He writes our name in the Lamb's Book of Life. If our name's written in that Book of Life, He knows us. He's not going to forget us. He's going to be there for us. We need to know Him. And we need to know that He knows us when He's got our name written in that Lamb's Book of Life. Moses now turns his attention to God Himself. He says, show me your glory. He wanted and he needed to see God more clearly. He wanted to know the holiness of God. The true servant of God is more concerned about the glory of God than anything else. Moses and the Jews had seen God's glory in the pillar of the cloud and the fire as God led them from Egypt to Mount Sinai. Now Moses wanted to see God in his glory personally. He wanted to know him personally. God did give Moses a glimpse. He told Moses, you go on the cleft of the rock, I will pass by. And you can't see my face, but you can see my back. He saw a little bit of God's glory. And Moses was happy with that. He was satisfied with that glimpse of God's glory. Now, the best remedy for a broken heart is a new vision of the glory of God. 
We want to know God better. Let's ask him for a vision of his glory. Let us get to know him better. Let us claim his promises and acknowledge our dependence upon God. Let us seek a new vision of the glory of God. And let us be prepared to make a stand for God. Our God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the lessons we can learn from your word. Lord, that sin is not acceptable. Disobedience is not acceptable. And that you will punish sin. But Lord, we thank you that you forgive us. And that you've made a way back to you from those dark paths of sin. Lord, that there's a door that is open and we may go in. Lord, we thank you that we can come to you today knowing that you have forgiven us. And Lord, that we might get a glimpse of your glory today in Christ's name.